know what? I'm going to do things a little differently today. I did this last night too. I was like, wow, that felt good. I'm just going to pop on the floor. Boop. Look at that. See how nimble I am? I'm not too bad for an old guy, right? <laughs> what did you just say? Agile. I thought you said man giant. And I was like, bro, I'm 5'10". I ain't no man giant. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Let me tell you guys. We have within our church what I would call a water problem. Let me explain. At multiple points throughout our church, we have these fancy water coolers, right? Culligan style, giant jug of water on top, little mechanism for releasing water on the bottom. And here at North Collins Wesleyan, we don't don't halfway anything. When we do water coolers, we go big or we go home. So our water coolers, they have temperature control. So if if you're feeling the thirst and you need an ice cold glass of water filtered to quench it, All you got to do is slide the little slider and press the button, and you got ice cold water right in your cup. But get this, it doesn't stop there. This is what makes our water cooler super special. If you want boiling hot water, you want some hot chocolate, you want a cup of tea, we got a button for that too. It's got a little coffee cup on it, it's got steam rising on it, it's ready. Just press that, super hot water. Not hot enough to scald your child's mouth, but just hot enough to get you you that hot chocolate and that tea. You can get steaming hot, you can get freezing cold, you can get anything in between. There's a slider that allows it. Whatever temperature you want, you've got it at the push of a button. And while there is a slight cost to the church as attenders, as people that we love, this extra super special deluxe water comes at no extra cost to you. It is completely free. And here at North Collins Wesleyan Church, we believe in hospitality. If you're out for a run, middle of the week, feeling the thirst, you can pop on in. If you're walking your dog, if you're just feeling bored and you need a cup of tea, come on in. We have the best water on the earth available at all times, so long as these doors are open. And you know what's crazy? For the life of us, we can't get anybody to drink it, right? We've been like strategizing. We've been buying special cups and things like that. Nobody will touch that water cooler. Instead, Instead, all the people go the other option. So a few months ago, some of our wonderful small group leaders went out of their way, spent money on their own dime to purchase a package of water bottles for their small group. And the strangest thing happened. These water bottles that were not purchased by the church and honestly not for all of the church, a bunch of lukewarm water bottles sitting unrefrigerated on the counter started disappearing like hotcakes but nothing draining out of that water cooler. And hear me when I say, I I get it. It's 8.57 on a Sunday morning. You've just wrestled with the whole morning ritual. You got up the hour before everybody else, specifically to spend the next hour trying to get everybody else up. Your spouse didn't go with a fight, without a fight, but after some nudging and schmoozing and even tickling, that's my spouse right there, they made the dangerous journey out of the bed and into the world. You've gone through the tedium that is preparing all of the children. All of the clothes are on and on all of the right appendages. Every single tooth has had at least a cursory scrub, every car seat filled and complained about. And as you make the rush into the lobby on time for the church, uh, for the church, I just sounded like my grandma. We're going to the Walmart. You make it here on time for the church. And that's when you realize it. Man, you are parched. In all of the effort to get everybody else ready, you have neglected yourself and dehydration is starting to kick in. That slight ache behind your eyes, the staleness of your breath that you're sure your neighbor can smell. And now all that you can think about is how dry your mouth is rather than how excited you are for worship. And right in front of you when you walk in that lobby is that fancy smancy water cooler one that you have to bend over like a Neanderthal to get the water from. The one that has the super cold water that comes out at a super slow trickle. It's going to take a minute and a half for you to fill your cup. And you don't have that kind of time. Church is about to start. You're dehydrated. You might not even survive that long. But downstairs, downstairs is that pile of water bottles. All you got is a twist. Boom. Water straight in your mouth. You're not going to be late for worship. Who's going to know? Nobody's going to know. And so you rush downstairs and you grab the bottle without thinking twice. 
Can I make a confession? If you're a water bottle grabber, you've done that. You're not the only one. I've been sitting here in my office super hot. I'm like, man, I don't want to wait for that trickle of water. I have had that water that doesn't belong to us directly in front of all of you while I've been preaching. In fairness to me, I didn't realize it didn't belong to us. I stole in front of you guys. So this is my confession. I owe our small group leaders a whole package of bottles of water. We have in our church all of the free water in the world at the exact temperature that we could want it in a way that's sure to quench our thirst more than lukewarm counter water bottles. But for most of us, the time and the effort doesn't feel worth the benefit to get that extra special water. And we find ourselves in the middle of what I find a kind of comedic, no condemnation kind of way, water problem. And with that, if you have your Bibles with, would you please turn with me to Psalm 42. Again, that's Psalm 42, and because it's a psalm, it's a shorter section of Scripture. It's very beautiful and poetic. We're just going to read through all of it together, not specific verses, all of it. And this week, we are starting this new series called The Well. So as we head into summer, we're going to be diving into the spiritual disciplines from scripture reading to prayer to fasting and everything in between, we're going to begin to understand the significance and the importance and the how and the why of each of these disciplines, even, even as we learn to return to our source of life and draw water from the well. And we begin that discussion today in Psalm 42, which reads, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All of your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let me ask you all a question this morning. Something just to reflect on. Are you feeling thirsty? Are you panting for the living water? Are you feeling weary? Is your soul feeling downcast in memory of a relationship with Jesus that was once vibrant but no longer is, or dreaming of a vibrancy that you've never seen? I would wager, if you're feeling that right now, you're not alone. I can say with all honesty, from my own perspective, you're not alone. We've had a heck of a couple of years, haven't we? It's been, it's been rough. A lot of us have seen a time of prosperity, right? We've seen a time of abundance. And I'd guess that most of us, because we've seen that time of abundance in this season, might be feeling a sense of scarcity. A craving and a longing. As a deer pants for the water, we are sustained on 
we live on. We thrive by the presence of our God, the living water. If that metaphor doesn't do it for you, the bread of life, the word of God, Jesus Christ. And in this season, for some of us, for some of us, I think that presence might just feel a little lacking. We hunger and we thirst for him. And in this season, for some of us, chances are a lot of us are looking for and craving a fresh and new revelation to dwell in his presence once more. And while we all know what it means to feel that craving, we've probably all felt it at some point. While we all know what it means to thirst, I can't help but wonder if some of our struggle might be that in our souls we have a water problem. Hear me when I say faith struggles, faith crises, they aren't always or even often the result of something we've done wrong or some sin we've committed. Jesus debunked that in John 9 with the man born blind. I'd recommend reading it. It's a great story. But if we thirst, most of us know where we can find the water cooler. You know what I'm saying? When I go to Scripture, I receive that bread of life. When I spend time in devotion, in prayer, I spend time in his presence. When I fast, when I serve, when I sit in silence and solitude, if I dedicate that time unto him, in each of these moments, I am returning to the water cooler for a drink. I'm taking my walk to the well to receive the abundance and the free source of life. And now, more than ever in our society, we have greater access to resources at the click of a mouse or the scroll of an app that can remove almost all difficulty of getting to the well. But I think a lot of us struggle with this water problem. It's interesting. I think it might be one of the greatest tricks of the enemy that in seasons when we feel hunger and thirst, In the seasons when it feels as though we walk in the middle of the driest deserts, wearied and worn, there is this lie that speaks into a lot of our minds that says to go to the well is to exhaust ourselves even more rather than to receive a drink. Or that to walk to the well is to add a cost to the water. A group of middle school boys surrounded me in my driveway, discipleship booklets in hand, sitting in their lawn chairs and sipping on warm glasses of cider. And the words of every single boy in the circle and almost every single kid in our youth group were reflected in the incoming sixth grader, Gunner. He looked at me with frustration and even honestly like this, something akin to desperation as he said in a frantic and fast voice, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy, he repeated again. It was the fall of 2020, still earlier in the days of COVID, and I was leading a youth ministry initiative that we were calling Drive-Through Discipleship. Now, at that time in Michigan, we still weren't allowed to have gatherings over 25 people, and we weren't allowed to have gatherings inside. So we had this idea as youth pastor, youth leaders, to have a functioning youth ministry. We would meet as small groups of students outside of leaders' yards and in their driveways, and we wanted to make this an extra special, extra special experience. So what we did, we would roll up our garage doors and we would put TVs out in the garage and we'd connect Nintendo switches. We'd throw out yard games. Kids would come and have a blast. And the main event of drive-through, drive-through discipleship was these discipleship booklets. And this booklet was cool. It removed all of the difficulty. If a student woke up in the morning and they felt like they could only dedicate 40 seconds, the booklet had a section where you could read one verse and answer one question just quietly in your head. The students feel a little next level. The booklet had where they could read a chapter and answer that same question with the depth of the chapter behind them. If a student was feeling a little more dedicated in their discipleship, they had a section for spiritual disciplines where they taught students how once a week to fast or practice solitude and things like that. And so everything, every resource in the world is available to them in this teeny tiny little book that guided them through everything. Each student had with them a tiny well with all of the water in the world to drink from that could literally fit in their pocket. And as I sat in that circle, I was surrounded by kids who were really struggling, 
all these kids who wanted to be with their buddies at youth group, all these kids who missed doing school in person, all of these church kids who genuinely knew a lot about Jesus and were feeling weary and thirsty. And almost every single student was summed up in the words of Gunner when I asked if they'd read their books this week. I'm just so busy. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't read it at all, Jordan. My whole week was crazy. I had school over Zoom. I had homework every single day. I had to help babysit my sister because my mom was home, but she was still working, and the lines between work and home were blurred. He didn't phrase it like that, but I'm translating for you because everybody knows that middle school boys speak a different language than us. And my heart hurt so much for Gunner because I got it. In the middle of COVID, for most of us, the lines between work and home between family and alone time, all of these things were blurred. Life felt entirely chaotic. It disrupted most of our rhythms and got us out of these rhythms, probably for a lot of us, including the rhythm of time alone with God. And so I understood when Gunner said, I don't have the time. But here's the thing about Gunner. Gunner was busy as all get out. But Gunner had all the time in the world for Minecraft. Gunner had all the time in the world for Super Smash Brothers on his Nintendo Switch. And I think there's something we can all learn from Gunner. As adults, it's easy for us to look at him and say, one of those darn kids with all of their devices. But there's a truth that Gunner needed to realize that I think chances are a lot of us might need to receive too. And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now. In a life filled with busy schedules for everyone, you make time for what is your priority. We Thank you. I just got an amen. Oh, whoo, y'all were sitting here quiet as church miles. Now I got energy. Y'all getting to go home early today. I'm so excited for you. Thank you, brother. I love it. We all know what it is to be busy, including the children and teenagers in our lives. Their lives are way more chaotic than mine was and yours was. Forgive me if you're a teenager. Your, your life is really chaotic. I know. Receive grace in the name of Jesus. We exist in the most plugged in and chaotic society and culture of busyness that has ever existed. And somehow, most of us have bought into this lie that my calendar controls me. When in reality, the only things that go on my calendar are the things that I decide go on there. I don't bow before my calendar. My calendar bows before me. And if my calendar tells me I don't have time to bow before God, that probably means that I'm bowing before something else. A lot of us don't like to sit alone. For a lot of us, reading feels like work. For a lot of us, the disciplines feel like a busy thing to add to an already busy plate that will leave us feeling more exhausted. For me, in these dry spell kind of seasons, I'm beginning to learn that perhaps my problem isn't a scheduling problem or a water problem. In all reality, there might be a Jordan's heart kind of problem. You know what I mean? Some time to sit and examine. And in a season of busyness, when one more thing that takes emotional or mental effort feels like a strain, maybe the best thing that I can do is carve out the time. Because more often than not, what feels like a strain on day one can feel like a cool drink of water on day five once we learn how to receive that peace. I'm going somewhere with this next question, I promise. Anybody else not like to drive? Am I the only one in this room? Steve, thank you. That was honest. That was vulnerable. I appreciate that. I wouldn't say I hate driving, and when Paul Randall brings his Firebird and he lets me drive it, I do like to drive. Thank you for that last week. That was a gift, man. I enjoyed that. But driving is definitely not one of the things on the short list of things that I would prefer to do. And for me, this is a bit of a combo deal of my own brokenness. It starts with my anxiety disorder. When I'm driving, I can't control what everybody else is doing on the road. And I'm about to give you a third sermon. All y'all New Yorkers are insane. I have lived in a lot of places. Y'all got no respect. You tailgate. You speed. You cut into lanes and cut people off. Calm down. If you have a Jesus sticker on your car, rip it off because you sure aren't representing him when you're on the road. 
white knuckle, both hands on the steering wheel when I'm driving on the highway in New York. I'm stressed. And then you factor in, I got ADD. And in most of my life, I've been able to function. I've been able to figure out how to survive well with it. But nowhere do I experience the effects of my ADD more than when I'm driving. To try to focus on the main thing when there's a thousand things going around so that I'm not the idiot that I'm talking about driving. Don't worry, you're not all idiots. I know you're extra special. You drive perfectly. You've never sped in your life. But you always go that five miles uh, over so that nobody uh, is stuck behind you. You're, you're great. Good job. Drive like that. My ADD is in such a way that after about 20 minutes of driving, trying to narrow my focus for that long, I find myself mentally exhausted and wearied. I, my, I get that brain fog. Like legitimately in seasons where I've been a guest speaker for different places, I always show up an hour early because it takes me that long to decompress and rest my brain and be able to speak clearly. So I've got ADD, I've got anxiety, and in turn, there's nothing wrong with driving. A lot of people go for a cruise just for fun, but for me, driving feels like a lot of work. It's a chore. And depending on the distance, it can feel like a big one. The girl of my dreams lived 45 minutes away. A little over a year ago, y'all know we're still newlyweds, and I'm going to keep talking about it. I know you're sick of it, but I still like her a whole lot. 45 minutes away, an hour and a half round trip. And we first started dating right up until when we were married to see Claire. To spend time with her took a lot of effort. Now, I don't love to drive, but I love my Claire a whole heck of a lot. And that's a fact that I realized really quickly. If an hour and a half of driving was what it took to be in her presence, to have all those ushy-gushy feel-good emotions that come with that puppy dog love when you still haven't figured out that that person toots too, ooh. I was a youth pastor for years, forgive me. I couldn't even say that hour and a half drive was a small price to pay. That was no price at all. I would have made that trip every single day if it meant I could have 30 seconds in her presence. And you know what's crazy? I don't love to drive. Every time I drive, I feel mentally weary. I get that brain fog. But man, I loved that drive. The entire way there, every time there was this excitement, this anticipation, I get to see her. I get to spend time with her. And the entire way back, I would just ruminate about her. Wow, she is something else. I can't believe how creative she is. Oh, man, is she a gifted baker? Oh, look, she's pretty. Oh, I, can't, I, can't be, I can't believe the way she pecked my cheek on the way out. Ooh, scandalous. Pastor got a kiss before marriage. <laughs> In a lot of ways, while she wasn't physically present when I was driving, that drive was an extension of her presence. And that drive, driving there wasn't something that earned her love for me. She didn't love me any more or less because I made the trip. The drive was just my way to, to get to the well. And eventually I began to realize that for me, that drive in many ways was the well. When we're practicing the spiritual disciplines, I really believe that what's happening is we are learning to love to drive because we're learning to love him so much that even just the thought of his presence begins to quench the thirst that we feel. And we're learning to love to drive specifically because we're learning that driving is an extension of his presence. Spiritual disciplines aren't there as an effort to earn his love. They aren't there to bore us or exhaust us or to steal time away from our days. The spiritual disciplines are simply the way we return to the well for a drink. The vehicle by which we step into the source of life and the extension of, the, of his presence in our lives day in and day out. And so as the worship team comes forward, and as we move into our time of response, here is our challenge for this week. Return to the well. All this series, we're going to be talking about the different spiritual disciplines, talking about how to do them and why we should be doing them. And we're going to give the tools to practice them. But in the meantime, 
do what you know and what you can. Carve out five, ten minutes in your day, whatever time you feel like you can justify or whatever time you feel like you can give undistracted for that time alone with God. And do the sorts of things that you know are going to connect you with him, right? So some people connect with God in nature. Plan to take an hour this week and go for a hike and make that hike a prayer walk. If you're joining us online, there are many good reasons for that. But if you're joining us online and you've been continuing to join us just because you've gotten out of the rhythm and the routine, come step back into this community right here in the presence of each other and God. Step back into this rhythm. And come out next weekend to experience our God together. We are his sheep. We know his voice. And in a season of a dry spell, the best thing that we can do is put ourselves in a position to hear him. Return to the well. Draw back to our source and receive the living water, the abundance of life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you are and all that you've done and all that you're doing in the life of our church. And God, I pray for anybody in this room who's feeling weary right now, that you would give rest and that you would give a drink, that you would give that fulfillment and the ultimate life. God, for people who don't feel like they can even make it to the well, that you would just rain down on them to give them that extra bit of pep to make it there. God, help us to understand what it looks like and what it means to receive the living water. And for each of us, would you quench our thirst? In Jesus' name.